So good morning, everybody. My name is Bart Pernel. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Leuven in the Department of Electrical Engineering, and we have a group of about 60 people doing research in cryptography, its implementations, and applications. And so in the second of course, I have a series of lectures. So if you don't get bored with me, you can see me more uh, during this week. And today I'll do the really basic stuff. We speak about cryptography. Uh, that's the bad news. Tuesday morning, cryptography. And there is also good news. There was almost no mathematics on my slides. So I'll try to just give you the basic concepts and try to explain to you what has changed, what, um, what is important, what we can do, what we cannot do. But I will try to stay away as much as possible from formulas and equations and try to give you a basic understanding. So in the course of this week, we'll look at um, key management protocols and authentication protocols, at how to manage public keys. Um, if you've been reading the press, you've been seeing all these attacks where malware actually changes uh, public keys inside your devices. Um, this morning, there was another uh, news about kind of malware called Privlog that does the same thing. So we'll speak about that more um, in a couple of days. We'll look at how crypto is used to secure networks. Um, then I'll give a talk on recent updates um, on what happened, what was revealed by Snowden, what are the implications on the use of cryptography. Um, and also last lecture on Friday on best practices. So many security courses start by saying security is about the C, I, and A. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And confidentiality, I fully agree, this is quite important. Um, integrity, I never know what it means. It's a very interesting concept because it means, means something different for everybody else. But of course, it can mean integrity of your data, integrity of your systems, integrity of your code. So it's, it's a very broad concept. And availability, again, is very important. Um, we kind of lost track of it um, until the late 90s. And then when the first denial of service attacks came, people started worrying more about this. So we have now more malicious attacks based on availability. It's not sure always crypto can help you there because very often crypto makes your system slower. And in fact, you may have more vulnerabilities to availability if you use crypto. But there are also crypto tricks uh, using proofs of work where you can use crypto to help availability. But let's go back to the basics. So historically, crypto was used for confidentiality of data. And for this, we use encryption. And this is a technique which is studied most and best understood. Um, but in fact, the surprising message is that today we don't just need encryption. In fact, if you think for your application you just need encryption, you probably haven't understood your application. What you do need, almost always, and especially in commercial applications, is data authentication. So there you want to authenticate your data, you want to know the source of your data, and you want to know your data has not been modified. This is important for code updates, but also for industrial systems or for your system of customers or transactions. For everything, it's very important. And so something cryptography, or cryptographers have learned in the past decade, I would say, is that what we really need in all applications is the combination of confidentiality and threat authentication, and we call this authenticated encryption. And we knew about this problem in the 80s. We had no good solutions. Uh, we got good solutions by the late 90s. But by then, all the standards had been done. I mean, IPsec, SSH, and so on. And so another problem was that the solutions we that were proposed are all patented, so nobody wants to go there and touch them. So there has been some more work recently on getting more efficient schemes and patent-free schemes to give you the authenticated encryption. So if you want to remember one thing from this lecture is, I don't need encryption. I need authenticated encryption. And we'll explain that more in detail, um, if not today, then on Friday. So what about the entities involved in a system? It could be the persons or the software processes or the devices. So you want to sometimes hide who they are. This is, I would say, more special. Um, but it is sometimes important. Think if you're running a website with medical information or think of elections or think if you have an um, oppressive regime and there is dissidents who want to speak out about what they see happening. Then you use anonymity techniques. And I believe George uh, will lecture about this later this week. But in most cases, we want to authenticate the entities involved. We want to find out who is whom. And cryptographers call this identification. So I will speak about this um, tomorrow. 
Now, it's important to be aware of this because in this world, there is two kinds of people, cryptographers and computer security persons. And so they have a different terminology for this. So crypto security people, they go up to a computer screen and it says first username and then password. The computer security people say giving your username is identification and giving your password is authentication. Okay, this is how they call it. I would call it user authentication to avoid confusion with data authentication or key authentication. But cryptographers are a bit weird people and following a paper by Shamir in the mid 80s we call identification proving who you are. And the world is more complex because people in biometry had yet other terminology. So you have to be very careful if you see identification or authentication, what is meant by it? Because depending on where they're from, people mean different things with the same word. And in general, my advice is if you see authentication, ask what is being authenticated to avoid confusion. Now, cryptographers can do much more, and I will not go too much in detail about this, but of course, you've learned about um, access control, what you can do with files, can you read them, can you write them, can you execute them, can you change ownership, this is called authorization. This can also be supported by cryptographic operations. Um, if you want to do something similar as signing a letter or a document or a contract or registered mail, then you need something called signatures. And we call this as a service, non-repudiation of origin or receipt. So you want to create evidence that somebody was involved in the interaction. You have more com complex things like signing contracts, notarization, and many more complex interactions like auctions um, or voting is an example. So the good news is that all these interactions you can do with cryptography. And in general, what cryptography allows you to do is get out the middle person. You don't have to trust a central entity like eBay for auctions, but you have to trust the cryptographers. So you have to decide for yourself what is worse, trust the cryptographer or trust eBay. But with Good cryptography, and of course, correctly implemented cryptography, you can actually get rid of full trust in the honesty of a service like eBay. That's the long-term goal of cryptography, and we'll speak about it more on Friday. Um, in a post-Northern world, this may become more important. So today, we just do the basics. We have the two most famous people in cryptography, Alice and Bob. And for some reason, Alice wants to send messages to Bob, and we call this clear text or plain text. Some cryptographers go quite far. They call their children Alice and Bob. I would not go so far. I think it's a bit one step too far. But so there is also the third person, Eve, who makes sure we have a living. And Eve tries to listen. The eaves is actually this, the part of the house that's sticking out. And so Eve sits under the eaves and tries to listen what's happening inside the house or tries to modify stuff. But historically, people were mostly concerned about um, listening in. And so, to protect themselves, Alice and Bob buy a crypto box. And with this crypto box, they can turn plain text into ciphertext. But of course, it doesn't help in a modern world, because in a modern world, Eve will just buy the same crypto box, and she can also plug it. So, to make this impossible, even if the crypto boxes themselves are publicly known, you can assume that this is widely known, we no longer keep our crypto boxes secret. And we've also learned that if you design secret crypto algorithms, it will take five or 10 years, then they will leak out. Um, even if you hide them in the hardware, some people will actually use sophisticated equipment to go find out what it is. And so you can't keep an algorithm secret for more than 10 or 20 years. So we assume the algorithm is public, but that there is a secret parameter, the key. Just like for normal house doors, you actually all have keys to your house or your office. And so everybody knows how a lock works. If you don't, you really have to urgently go home and open your lock and see how it works. It's really fascinating. So you know how it works. There is no secrets about it. But if you don't have the key, you can't open a particular lock. So of course, uh, an important conclusion from this is that cryptography does not solve your problem of confidentiality. It only moves the problem to managing the keys. The big question is, how do I manage those keys? How do Alice and Bob get this key in the first place? We'll speak about this more tomorrow, but so cryptographers shift the problem of securing data to securing keys. And if you don't secure your keys properly, well, then cryptography is actually useless. And as this is a software security course, it's a very big problem to hide keys in software. If your keys are in software, someday they will be hacked out, believe me. 
So this is why for high security applications, people prefer things like smart cards or HSMs or more sophisticated stuff to actually hide your keys because if your keys are for grabs, well, then you're lost. So I will not say too much about all cipher systems, but a little bit to give you some taste of how they look like. Um, we'll speak a bit about the model. We give you a very good scheme, the Vernam scheme, which is very secure but not very practical. And then we look at some more modern ciphers, which are very important. DES is still important for banking. Um, AES is getting more and more important, and RC4 is disappearing. But I want to say a few things about this. So cryptography is as old as writing itself. As soon as people could actually write, they were starting to encrypt stuff. So Babylonians, Egyptians, and so on. The Greeks, they all had their own methods. Um, but somehow, all textbooks use a very simple example, the Caesar cipher, allegedly used by Julius Caesar. And the idea is to just shift letters in the alphabet. So a T becomes a W, an H becomes a K, and so on. And so we see already a very important um, mistake here. Julius Caesar never changed his key. Okay. Um, by the way, there is also mobile operators who give the same key, KI, to every user. So you see that these problems of being sloppy with keys is not um, a new problem. It has been happened all over the times. Now, of course, this is not a very secure system because if I'm given a ciphertext, I can just shift it over one position, two positions, three positions, and so on. So the T becomes a U if I shift over one position. A T becomes a V if I shift over two. So you will find in the first column the alphabet, in the second column the alphabet. I can keep doing this. And so after a little bit of effort, I now found the plain text and the key, right? Anybody had it? Everybody is awake, must by now have found it. So the plain text is cryptanalysis is fun and the key is 17. Okay? So what do we learn from this? That is we need many more keys because the opponent can always try all possible key values like trying to break into a safe and, or a bike lock and trying all combinations. So you need many key values. Um, and many today is at least, I would say, an 80-bit space. And most people prefer today a 128-bit space. There were already very old manual systems with a huge key space, like simple substitution. Simple substitution, there you place an A, say, by an M, so any random choice you want. Then a B by everything except for an M. And then a C, everything except for M and Z and so on, so you have a permutation. And so then you have a huge number of keys. I'll show you on the next slide how many. You can also move letters around. A T is moved here. The R is moved, in this case, in the same place. The A is moved there, and so on. So you move letters around. And this also has many possibilities. How many? Well, for an alphabet of N letters, N factorial. So if you calculate this for 26, our normal alphabet, this is 26 factorial. This is 4 times 10 to the 26. That's about a 75-bit key. So even today, cracking such a system by trying all possible keys would be quite expensive. So assume you have written very fast code that does it in one nanosecond, tries one key. And this would be pretty tricky to do. I guess doing 10 nanoseconds, you could do it, or 20, but one is really fast on modern machines. But assume we can do it. So you have 10 to the 9 keys per second. You have about 100,000 seconds in a day. It's 86,000, it doesn't matter. You have about 400 days in a year, okay? So you see that on one computer, it will still take you 10 to the 10 years to find all, or to try all possible keys. And even if you had a million computers, it would still take you 10,000 years. This is a very old system, and you could not break it by trying all possible keys. But you can break it using simple statistics. This is statistics for English. Here you indicate the frequency of every letter. And what you see in English that E is the most frequent letter. It's about 12%, followed by the A and the I and so on. So how can you use this? If you have a little bit of ciphertext, say half a page or a page, you will see that in this case, the S is the most frequent letter in the ciphertext because it corresponds to an E, so you can decrypt now the S's. And you find the second most frequent letter is the M, and you know it's an A, and you can use like combinations of two letters, TH, is very common in English, and so on. So with a little bit of statistics, you can actually decrypt this in less than a second. By the way, this method was known uh, to the Arabs, and so it was already applied in the 9th and 10th century to break simple substitution. 
But Queen Mary of Scots didn't know about this, so she was using simple substitution. And her opponents had a well-trained cryptographer who knew about the state of the art, and you all know what happened to Queen Mary of Scots. Okay, so the advice is you should be aware of the latest developments in cryptanalysis, because otherwise uh, your life may be in danger. So what does it mean to break a crypto scheme? Breaking a crypto scheme means finding the key, like we did for the Caesar cipher, or finding plain text, like we did for a simple substitution. You could find parts of the plain text. This is already quite bad. So as I showed you, you can always try all possible keys. We call this exhaustive key search. And it works for any cipher. Solution is to have a large key space. And large means, I would say, at least 80 bits and probably 100 bits to 128 bits. But even if you have a large key space, there will always be shortcut attacks to find the key faster. Okay? And so history has shown you that you should never trust cryptographers. We are eternal optimists. We always come up with new ciphers and we really think, oh, this time it's really much better and my system cannot be broken by anybody. And sometimes it takes a minute, sometimes it takes an hour, sometimes it takes 10 years, sometimes it takes 20 years, but many crypto systems get broken by people who are cleverer than the inventor, okay? And so if you decide to use a crypto system, you should always also think, what will be my next crypto system? And how will I replace it? Because don't trust us, guys. We're liars and optimists. We always come with new ciphers, and we always find flaws in existing ciphers. And last year, I was asked by people who produce a medical device they want to implant in children and should go with them for the rest of their lives. They said, we want to have a secure update for 90 years. Which crypto should I use? And I say, I don't have an answer to this. I don't know. I don't think I can give you something. This is the best I can do today, but you know, I'm afraid that you will have to open this skull again in 30 years to replace the crypto. Or maybe you should design the device so that you can upgrade the crypto remotely. But then how will you protect that? Interesting questions. So, Cryptology is the science of secrets, although today I think we're more worried about authentication of data and entities. So cryptos means hidden in Greek, and logos is word or science. It consists of two components. You have the people who make crypto systems. So graphine means writing in Greek, so cryptography, writing secrets. And cryptanalysis, this is the fun part, this is breaking other people's stuff. Okay? So since the first half of the 19th century, we follow a Dutch cryptographer called August Kerkhofs, you see there on the picture, who wrote principles for cryptography. And one principle he says is you should assume your opponent finds out your algorithm. Even back then, 200 years ago, he said, be careful. At some moment, your algorithm will leak. He was thinking, of course, of war, where the cryptographer would see hundreds of horses coming, running at him. And then the cryptographer would run away and would leave his crypto box behind to save his life. Okay, and he says, put the key in your pocket, but your crypto devices you will leave behind. And I think this is very wise advice. So today, with reverse engineering of software or hardware, your algorithms will leak. But even then, even if the opponent knows the algorithm, um, the cipher should be secure. That doesn't mean that in some very specific cases, it's not justified to keep your algorithm secret. It can give you some protection for five or 10 years to put the algorithm secret, but then don't make your own algorithm and ask an expert. And I know some companies who make their own algorithms and have experts review them every three years to make sure they're still up to standard. But don't make your own algorithms at home. Please don't do this. If you're not an expert in cryptography and you make such an algorithm, we can typically break it in a few minutes. So people, the only people in my group we're allowed to design algorithms are people who make a PhD for four years. Okay? That's what it takes to make a cryptographic algorithm, to learn how to do it, to learn how to protect yourself. So we also assume that Eve knows some information on the plain text. So in the example of a Caesar cipher, you found the plain text because it was English and all the rest was random stuff. If my plain text would have been random, you would have never found it. But in general, plain text is redundant and is written in a language, otherwise it's not very useful. Most of us don't send random messages to each other. We usually send meaningful messages. Very often, part of your plain text is known. If you look at military messages, they will start with top secret. Or if you look at the Snowden documents, you will find TS, 
and then some other abbreviations. So very often the adversary knows what the beginning of the message is. So if you take a Microsoft Word document, it starts also with a very redundant beginning of eight kilobytes, uh, where you can probably guess most of it. Now, modern crypto systems are designed to resist much more powerful attackers, like attackers that choose part of the plain text and look at the cipher text. So you even give Alice, or sorry, Eve control on the plain text. So you let her play a bit with the crypto box. This sounds weird, right? Why would you do this? Well, it's just how things are. If you take a smart card, any modern day smart card, which is used by the banks, it actually has a, it follows the standard ISO 7816. And the standard says you have a command called internal authenticate, which means you send to the card a plain text and the card has to send you back the cipher text. It's part of the specifications, which the card uses to prove that it's really the correct card. So in fact, here you have it, a free chosen plain text attack on the cipher as much as you want. You can send as many planes as you want and get all the cipher texts. Okay? If you look at web servers, if you want to talk to a web server like Amazon or eBay, to prove who they are, you produce a cipher text with their public key. I'll come back to that later. And then this web server kindly decrypts it for you and sends you the answer. So in fact, you can choose a cipher text and the web server by protocol has to actually produce you the plain text. Hopefully the same key is not used to encrypt meaningful things because then you could actually use it as we call it as an oracle to decrypt anything you want for you. But so the protocol is designed like this that you should not be able to do this. But so in general people believe that this is very difficult to do in practice but in practice it's very easy because many protocols specify this kind of access to crypto protocols, to crypto algorithms. So the good news is that we believe that modern ciphers resist those attacks. Okay, but then again, don't trust cryptographers. Now, when I started doing crypto in the late 80s, there were crypto boxes. They cost about 10,000 euro, 20,000 euros. And they were only found in banks and in government agencies. And they were in secured rooms with confidential data or top secret data, and they were making connection to another room with such data. Today, if you look in your pockets, you may have car keys with crypto. You have an identity card with crypto. Um, you have bank cards with crypto. You may have a pay TV system with crypto, with smart cards. So it's very different. Crypto is now used everywhere and it's in our hands. And in fact, you can easily think of scenarios. For example, I rent a car and I get the key or the valet parking system, where in fact, the person who has the key is not to be trusted. So this is very different. Crypto is no longer a secure environment. Crypto can now be in the hands of the attacker. And if you look at modern day crypto, I think I counted about 30 billion crypto devices. Okay. In fact, very few of these devices are there to protect users' confidential data. They're mostly there to authenticate you, to authenticate transactions, and to protect content against the user. So in industry, the user is the enemy, and crypto is there to keep data out of the hand of the users. Think of videos, movies, right? There the crypto is used against you because you're seen as the enemy. Now that makes a very interesting threat model because now as a user, I hold a crypto device and I'm the enemy. So I can start torturing it, okay? Because this is my enemy. The same thing, by the way, for your bank cards. Most people think that their bank card is there to protect themselves against thieves. No, in the banking model, you are the thief. And the bank card is there to prevent you from, from stealing money or uh, fraud in the credit card system. In the credit card world, you are the potential attacker for the, for the credit card company. And the credit card is there to protect you against, to protect Visa against you, more or less. So in those settings, you have actually incentive to start playing with these things and see whether you can get the keys out because you're the bad guy anyway. So why would you not also play that role? And so what has been discovered by the secret services already in the 40s and 50s, by the hackers in the early 90s and by the open community in the mid 90s is that actually by using timing information or power consumption or acoustics, you can actually get keys out of devices. Okay. And then even more powerful if you start really torturing stuff. So you start changing the voltage level of the input, changing the clock or shining with a laser or with other beams of devices, 
you can make them get a hiccup and get also they may get the key out. Okay, so here you see a simple example of a setup uh, for many laps. Now have this kind of thing. It costs about I mean, the scope costs about 40,000 euros, but for a good one, but you can get a cheap one for 10,000. You have a smart card reader where you put the card in. You actually measure the voltage over the card contacts, which give you the, because the voltage varies um, with the power consumption. In fact, the voltage over this resistor measures the current, so you can measure the power consumption of the card. And then you look at this in the oscilloscope, you store this in a PC, and then you go for later analysis. Um, for this, you need to use the card in a modified card reader. Here we have a more sophisticated setup, which is a very expensive 10 cent copper wire uh, made into an antenna and put above a ship. And crypto operations are being calculated, and you can just read out the zeros and the ones of the key. So physics beats mathematics. Okay, with using physics, you can actually break many crypto devices by using, in this case, electromagnetic radiation. So in crypto, we have to now look at new models. It was very surprising. And so today, of course, all the bank cards or the high-end bank cards are protected against these attacks. But those devices are not. They're not protected. So how difficult it is to get the key out? Well, it's not that easy because very often you don't know how the chips work. The chips have no numbers and whatever. So you may spend a week or a month to get the chip working and to really know where the crypto starts. But once you have the data, in less than a day, you have the key out in such a device. So the model is that Eve also has access to side channel information, which can be the timing of uh, the crypto algorithm or the power consumption or the radiation or the acoustics. By the way, timing is a big problem. We know about this problem already since 96. It's the first formal paper about this. But in fact, there is still very few crypto libraries that are constant time. And implementing an algorithm in constant time is very hard. And for example, Google has abandoned AES-CBC about a year ago because they've tried for a long time with many smart people to implement it in constant time and they've given up. They can't. They say, we can't do it. It's so difficult that we're actually going to switch to different crypto. So it sounds easy, but you should not forget that the manufacturers of processors try to speed up their devices and they keep putting new optimizations in and those optimizations may have as consequence that your crypto which was constant time before no longer is afterwards. So this is an eternal curse for cryptographers or people who have libraries. You have to keep taking, making sure that on every new processor the crypto is still constant time. Because in fact the optimizations of the intels are working against you. And Intel now is a team looking at this specifically to avoid these problems in the future. But it's a, a very common problem. It's hard to find constant time libraries. Okay. So back to history. I will not say too much about them, but two famous machines. Well, the one on the right is famous, the Enigma. You probably all heard about it. Broken by, used by the Germans, broken by the Polish. We told the French. We then told the British and then um, Alan Turing perfection the attack, and so the German, the German traffic was being read, the traffic to the U-boats, which probably played an important role in uh, winning World War II. The device on the left I find much more interesting because it was a device used by the Americans for strategic communication. And it's more interesting because you never heard about it. It's called Sigaba. Anybody heard about Sigaba? Probably not. Sigaba was declassified in 1995. So they took 50 years after World War II to declassify it. So Sigaba is also a bit bigger. And if you look on the top, Sigaba has two rows of rotor. And the back row drives the movement of the first row. So the, the rotors move irregularly. And that made Sigaba much harder to break. Um, I went several times to the NSA museum. And so the, the staff there um, are actually NSA employees or ex-NSA employees. And they don't want to answer questions about Sigaba even today. So we still don't know everything about this device. OK, so as a node cryptographer, we should not start looking at rotor machines. I mean, they're not really any good. They're just nice for, for entertaining your audience and making con connections to history. But what you should know is that many people think they have bright ideas for crypto systems. Um, today, hopefully, we have mathematical tools to test them. 
And if you survive the first test, you publish them, and then you will find that there will be, on, on the world, there will be hundreds of cryptanalysts trying to break your stuff, at least if your design looks interesting. And you also know that, especially if you try to make something very fast or very original, that in 95% of the cases, your cipher will be broken in the next year. You'll end up in the graveyard of cryptography, where there is thousand other ciphers, and the cipher will join it there. So, if you survive a few years of cryptanalysis, and some people actually attract cryptanalysis by offering money, so if you break it, you get some sum of money. So if you can demonstrate people couldn't break it, then you may go to implementation standardization, which is sometimes done, sometimes not, and you make, make your money. Although I must say, I don't know many cryptographers who made lots of money designing crypto schemes. Most cryptographers are actually poor people. We just have good fun, but we don't make money. Um, in fact, one exception I know is a very simple cipher used in these kind of car keys, uh, which a South African guy sold for $5 million. I mean, a cipher which you can describe in two slides. Well, I think per slide was a very efficient way of making money. But the most important part of this slide is the last thing. You should plan to take your algorithm out of service. And the problem is that this is something everybody forgets. And in software, it's kind of easy. Although, of course, we have to worry about the other side. I mean, those of you from Belgium may have seen that there was this lot of fuss in the news last week um, on Monday because uh, somebody had looked at the SSL or TLS settings of all the banks and found that some were good and some were not good. First, I don't think that the SSL settings are the way, the way that b banks are not broken into by breaking the crypto on the TLS. So I think there was kind of a fuss about nothing. But it's actually very difficult for a bank to switch off, say, SSL version 3 because then the old grandmother who had been using the same thing for 12 years on her old PC actually can no longer do her banking, right? This is the problem. Even in software, it's very hard to force people to buy a new machine or to get a new browser or whatever. But of course, in the embedded device, it's much worse. Bluetooth cipher is broken since 10 years ago, but Bluetooth keeps continuing as if nothing happened because it's just too difficult to replace all Bluetooth devices. So think about this carefully, how you will deal with new algorithms. So in some sense, we don't need this because the perfect cipher is already known and it's known as the Vernam Skino one-time path, although some recent research has pointed out that in fact the device um, or the, the method was invented by Frank Miller in 1882, so it's actually older than believed. Frank Miller is the guy on, on the right, bottom right. So it was invented during the gold rush in California. And the cipher is very simple. You just have a plain text, you add a key, Indeed, the operation to encrypt is just addition, addition modulo 2 or XOR. It's very simple, and if you do the same thing again, you get the plain text back. This is a mathematical exercise. It's too easy to even um, explain it to you. You can figure it out from an example. So the people who invented it didn't know how good it was, but it was simple, was easy to implement. Vernam used paper tapes and a simple device to implement it. Um, and Vernam wrote in his paper, I did some field tests and it seemed to be secure. As if you can actually find out whether something is secure using a field test, but that was a state of the art 100 years ago. But then during World War II, Claude Shaman, on the top right, invented information theory, a big breakthrough in modern science. And he also wrote a paper, we applied this to cryptography. And then a few years after the war, he was allowed to publish it. And he actually proved that this scheme offers you perfect secrecy. What does it mean? It means that no matter how many ciphertext you see, no matter how many computers you have, you will not learn any information from this system on the plain text. Or in other words, the ciphertext gives you no additional information on the plain text you didn't know already before. This is the best you can ever hope to get. Okay, so in fact, the solution is available. Anybody's using the one-time path here? Why not? Because you can use your key only once. Okay, so you, your key is as long as the message, you can use it only once. By the way, there are still diplomats using it. It was used for the red telephone between Moscow and Washington until the late 80s. We don't know what's used today. Um, and there is still some companies selling these devices. I even know a company selling the devices together with the keys. I'm not sure I would trust that, um, but okay. 
By the way, if you want to read more about the use of the one-time pad, the Russians used the one-time pad and they used it twice um, because they printed their keys four times and the Brits and the Americans discovered this and this is known as Venona. And some people were caught and executed as a consequence of this very big mistake to use your one-time pad twice. So it's a simple mathematical exercise. If you use the one-time pad twice, then you can just find the sum of the plain text and then if you're clever enough, you can actually figure out individual plain text. And so this is how some people were caught, like the Rosenbergs. Now, there is also physics. And some one-time pad devices were, again, broken based on physics. So, of course, inside the one-time pad device, you have only four possible operations. Um, zero plus one is one, and one plus zero is one. So one means a high voltage. Okay. And then you also have zero plus zero is zero, and one plus one is zero. Now, of course, logically, this is a low voltage. It turned out in some devices, the waveform was different. And if you put this signal on the line, then, of course, the opponent can see whether he has the yellow curve or the blue curve. And in fact, he knows in half the cases when the plaintext bit is 0 or 1. So what does it teach you is that in security, but in cryptography also, if you go one abstraction layer below, you can, may be able to break things. Because cryptography makes assumptions of right zeros and ones, but we don't make assumptions about how a zero looks. We say it's a low voltage, but here in both cases, the two lower curves are low voltages, but they're just different, right? So it would be easy to stop this attack, of course, by using another level of logic, but so this is how some devices were also broken in practice, because at the lower abstraction level, you may always see things which are not there, which you take exception of at the higher layers. So, in cryptography, we see very little of this information trading security. It's very attractive because you don't need to take into account the computational power of your opponent, so this is very nice. Um, and you can make nice proofs, but in general, most of these schemes are not very practical. We have to admit that. So, what you see today in most of cryptography is uh, System-based security, this is like the rotor machines, and well, we now have modern rotor machines called LFSRs or block ciphers or other things. Um, some of my friends call this prayer theoretic security because, you know, you design a crypto system and every night you pray that nobody will break it. And so, in fact, we can't prove that it's hard to break something because it's just very hard to do. You just make a system, you hope nobody can break it, and then you put it out. Now, there has been quite some progress in the last 30 years using complexity theory. So there has been a theory developed in computer science about which problems are hard and which problems are easy. And this has made major advances in cryptography, which also means if you would go to a crypto conference after this course, you would not understand anything. These people would talk Chinese to you or something really understandable because they actually have defined a formal language in which they actually have assumed the model of computation. It can be a Turing machine or some other abstract thing. But the very good thing is we now have formal definitions of what it means to be secure. And it took us about 10 years to figure out what secure encryption is. Okay, we're now still working on what a secure channel is. And some definitions, like what a secure protocol is for key establishment, are eight pages long. So this is very fundamental work. It's very important, but it just shows you how difficult it is to formalize stuff. And so these things, they say, we have a proof. I mean, indeed, what they do in this approach is they have reduction proofs. They say, if you can break this system, then you can solve a hard problem. That's what they say. This is, it gives you a very good feeling. There is just one problem. We don't know which problems are hard. And proving a problem is hard is very hard. In fact, we don't know which problems are hard. We don't even know that one-way functions exist. Okay, so as you will see, RSA is based on factoring, but is factoring hard? We don't know. But at least you can go to your boss and say, if my system is broken, then actually um, also factoring is broken and there's a major breakthrough in mathematics. So it gives you a better feeling. It gives you a better understanding of where the weaknesses are. But of course, be aware, we don't know which problems are hard. And also, we don't know which implementations are secure. Right? So today, many crypto systems are broken because the hacker finds the key somewhere in the software or because there is a timing attack on the implementation and so on, or you can go around the crypto. 
But still, this actually is a very, very good approach. It's scientific. It allows you to find out exactly the relation between a crypto primitive and a hard problem. And this is, I think, very promising. Hopefully, we'd also make more progress in proving which problems are hard, but this goes very, very slow. So, if you don't want to use the one-time path, we just build a complex machine. And those machines, the first machines were rotor machines. Today, we have LFSRs and other devices. What you do is you have a finite state machine. I guess you all know about this stuff. It's kind of basic system design. You have a state. You have an update function. You have an output function. Okay? And then you also have to initialize this thing. And so the state may be keyed. The next state function may be keyed. Or the output function may be keyed. Or all of them, a combination of them. There is devices in all kinds of categories. But if you do a good job, what comes out of this machine looks really random. OK? And so Bob has the same machine, and he produces the same random sequence. So what you kind of do is you're lazy. You don't want to send a terabyte for the one-time path. But you actually have a 128-bit key, and you build a small machine that stretches 128 bits into a terabyte. That's what you really do with the stream cipher. You take a short key, and you stretch it into a long key. And then you can use this in the one-time path. OK, that's the philosophy of a stream cipher. So, of course, this is not really random because it comes out of a small machine, so it's not really random. But what you hope is that for the opponent, it doesn't make a difference, that the opponent doesn't have enough capability to tell this apart from a really random string. And so in that case, you would be as good as the one-time part, but much more efficient because you just have a short key to agree. So why do we have the IV? Well, think of wireless communication. Every packet, you want to restart your engine. And so with the IV, you will reset the engine and start producing key stream. Or another example is on a computer system, every file, you want to use a different key stream. By the way, if you would not do this, I don't know whether I can find pens, but if you would not do this, you have the Venona scheme, there are the pens. So this is the attack also done on the Russians. It's the most difficult mathematics I will do with you. It's really, really easy. So ciphertext 1 is plain text 1 plus the key. OK. And you have a second equation. Ciphertext 2 is plain text 2 plus the key. And then you add those up. And whether you find ciphertext 1 plus ciphertext 2 is plain text 1 plus plain text 2. So if you actually use the same key sequence twice, you can find from the sum of ciphertext the sum of plain text. This is not deep mathematics, right? Anybody could figure this out. Kiptamalists call this in-depth transmission. In-depth because you reuse your key again, and then you can figure this out. So this is what the Russians did. And this also would happen if you have no IV, and you would keep using the same key stream over and over. You would say, nobody ever does this. Well, the Russians did this. And for example, Microsoft 10 years ago, in their word encryption, they had no IV. So if you had a few Word documents, you could just XOR them, the ciphertext, and find the XOR of the Word documents. One of my students found out about this about 10 years ago. Microsoft has fixed it since then. And so it's a very common mistake to not have an IV in a stream cipher or to reuse an IV, and then you have a big problem, because then you have this problem. So you want to design a system so that you can't try all possible keys. So how big should my key be? Because, of course, the opponents can always try all possible keys. So a 40-bit key to the 40 instructions, this is what US export allowed until 15 years ago. Well, this is trivial. Okay. A 60-bit key to the 60, I think a PhD student who is quite motivated can actually do this. I think Bitcoin is today to the 70-something hash for operations per block. So 2 to the 60 is definitely feasible for a PhD student. 2 to the 70 is feasible for people who really put dedicated hardware, like Bitcoin does this. To the 80 is hard, except for the NSA and GCHQ and Chinese and the Russians. So if you really want to be OK, you use 128-bit key. And the slide gives a bit more detail. You can figure that out later. A second thing to observe is Moore's law. So Moore's law is the blessing of all computer scientists, because it means no matter how lousy our code is, every year it gets, every 18 months it gets twice faster. Okay, and somehow we keep 
we managed to make our systems more lousy and lousy, so our computers are slower and slower over the time, right? I don't know. If you do the dir command on a PC today, it's actually slower than a dir command on a PC in the late 80s. But okay, that's something else. But so for cryptography, it's very important that every 18 months you lose one qubit. So every 18 months, your opponent with the same budget can break a system with one qubit more. So if you look in the future, if you want to be secure for the long term, you need to take this into account. What I suggest today is don't use anything with less than 70 bits of key. 80 bits for short term security, like say a car, a car maybe that's okay, although the problem is I may have this car for 15 years, or the car may drive around for 15 years, and in 15 years 80 bit keys will be a joke. So maybe even there is not so, not so a good idea, but for like movie, protection of a movie, a movie is very valuable, but after five years it's out there anyway, so for low value things 80 bits may be okay. If you want long term security you go for 100 bits, and then what the heck go for 128 and you're Okay, for a long time. Okay. So, that's not the end of the story. Because, in some cases, to enter a system, it's enough to find one out of two to the T keys. Say a bank has a million customers. If I want to break into the bank and I can guess the keys or passwords of one customer out of a million, then I'm in. And maybe I can do privilege escalation and do more attacks. So in fact, if I have a million customers, I somehow in this kind of attack model, I lose a factor of a million in my key. And I should take this into account when choosing my key length. Okay? So the other thing is, if you're the NSA, you have a different goal. You have a million targets, or probably several million targets, and you want to find all their keys. This is also easier than finding the keys one by one. There is a solution or technique known by Hellman in the 80s. It actually shows that if you have to search a k-bit key space, then you can do once two to the k steps. So you have to search the whole key space once. You store two to the two key over three. Okay. And then you can find any key in time two to the two key over three. So that means that even in this case, in this model, a 90-bit key is probably not enough against the NSA. Because they can find your key in 2 to the 60. Okay? This is known as time memory trade-off, or the, a modern improvement is rainbow tables. So this is sometimes how it is being called. So, for example, the companies who offer to recover your Microsoft Word or Excel or whatever zip password, they use this technique. So even if your password is 60 bits, they can actually, within a second, give you your password. Okay? So, you have to be very careful. And so, this is another reason to not be on the edge and to use large enough keys. And even 128-bit keys, they could be only 80-bit keys. If you have many users, um, there is a risk there. So, don't be skimpy on keys. Longer keys usually don't cost you much in symmetric crypto. So, the ciphers I showed you are known as self-synchronizing stream ciphers. As I told you, you have to be synchronized. Sorry, they're, they're synchronous stream ciphers, not self-synchronous. They're synchronous. So that means that the recipient has to be in sync with the sender. Okay? So you need this IV to synchronize the two devices. And if you mess it up, like was done in web, the web protocol, then you have big problems. The reason why these things are used is because there is no error propagation. So if one bit in the ciphertext flips, only one bit in the flame text flips. And so for wireless, this is essential. In wireless, you don't want error propagation in decryption. And so the key stream is independent of the data. So I already mentioned this, that you should avoid repeating key stream. It's a very important um, that if you have a fixed key and you repeat the IV, you will get the same thing out and you have this attack and then you're in deep trouble. So you have to always make sure this does not happen. So what to use? Well, A51 is not secure, E0 is not secure, RC4 is not secure. Well, Snow 3G, I think this is a mistake. This bracket should be one up. Snow 3G, as far as we know, is still secure. This is, I should correct this. And there is some other um, stream ciphers. So I'll speed up a bit. This is the cipher used in GSM. Uh, in your GSM phone, 
Um, the only thing I want to say about this, it uses three rotors or three LFSRs. This is just one bit memories. You shift them to the left and then you fit, feed in a sum of the other bits. And so what is interesting is that these LFSRs move irregularly. So in fact that you clock either three or two of them and you, sometimes you, one doesn't move. And so this makes it much more secure than you would think. It's still not very secure. It can be broken uh, in seconds. But if you would make longer registers, it would be quite secure. And so, in fact, the principle used here is the same principle as the SIGABA principle. SIGABA is irregular moving rotors. Here you have irregularly moving LFSRs. So it's a very important principle. Uh, one weakness of these things is that if you can observe the power consumption, you may see how many registers move. And this may be used to break stuff. But so today, with the rainbow tables, you can actually download a terabyte of rainbow tables, and then you can break with a few frame times, frames, you can actually break GSM in seconds. If you want to use script analysis, it will take you 10 minutes on a piece, on old PC, but you need three or four minutes of ciphertext. So the GSM cipher is badly broken. Bluetooth cipher is badly broken. I don't have time to explain it in detail, but now let's go to IC4. So IC4 is a cipher designed by Ron Rivest. Um, it's a quite old cipher. It was done in 87. It was arguably the first cipher for software. So you should go well remember that crypto was always done in hardware because software was too slow and was insecure. People realized that a key in software will always be exposed, so you do crypto in hardware. But then with the PC, uh, people realized that they wanted to encrypt on PCs as well and that there were different threat models. So this is when Rivest made his cipher. It's based on a secret permutation of bytes. Okay, I will skip the key setup, you can figure that out. But essentially after the key setup, you have an array of bytes which contain a permutation of the values between zero and 255. It's a very simple cipher. There is two pointers, I and J. In step one, you move I forward by one. So every time it moves around the array. And J jumps widely. So J jumps by how much? And you look in the value here, pointed at by I, it's 92, so you will jump J by 92 steps. So you have one pointer that's just moving around and the other one is jumping wildly. The next step is to swap the values pointed at by J and I. Okay, so it was a permutation, it remains a permutation. And now you have to produce output. And how do you do that? Well, you add those two values it becomes an address, so 162 plus 92 is an address, and you read out the value stored at this address, this is a byte. This is a very elegant cipher. And if you look at it the first time, you say this can't be secure. If you would remove one step, any step you want, it becomes ridiculously insecure. But as it is now, nobody knows, even if you're given a lot of output, how to find the key. So how to produce the state of this permutation because it keeps changing over time. So this is pretty secure. The best attack requires two to the 240 steps. On the other hand, the statistics of this sequence are terrible. There is many deviations and biases. And in the beginning, people thought it's not so bad, but in fact, uh, two years ago, some people showed that if you keep sending the same message 10 million to a billion times, which can be done with browser injection attacks, then using simple statistics, you can just find easily most of the first 256 bytes of the plain text. So just simple statistics. I mean, I could teach you the attack in five minutes. And I think it's 10 lines of code. It's a very simple attack. You just have to assume that the same plain text is being sent over and over, which you can do with a browser script injection. OK? Also, in web, it was a disaster. And so because of those problems, Google decided to abandon RC4. So strange enough, RC4 was not widely used because it was a secret cipher. Then it gained some popularity, then it was abandoned, and then somehow it was reintroduced without asking any cryptographers. And then when cryptographers looked at it again and broke it badly, then it was removed again. So it's a very, it had a very bizarre um, lifetime. So, the workhorse of modern crypto is block ciphers. With a block cipher, you take advantage of memory and you operate on larger units. Um, historically, in the 70s to the 90s, 64 bits. Today, it's 128 bits, 16 bytes. 
And somehow it's easier to make a secure block cipher because you deal with many bytes at the same time. So you can do, say, 200 operations on all those bytes and then output something. In a stream cipher, there is a lot of pressure to do a few things and output something. Right? Like in RC4, you did five operations and you had to produce output. In a block cipher, you can do 200, a total mixing of everything, and then you output something. So as a cryptographer, I would say I can make you a new block cipher in a few days. A stream cipher, I would ask for a few months, and I would still have more confidence in the block cipher. And you also find that there is more standard block ciphers that are widely used than stream ciphers. So block ciphers operate on larger units, and maybe I should kill this slide because you should never, ever use a block cipher like this. Okay, this is the ECB mode. You should never, ever do this. And I think I'm going to kill this slide because it probably will inspire people to do it anyway. So how does this? It's a really bad way. And I can show you, I should probably show you on Friday with a simple picture. This is really a bad idea. But if you take a random standard like a smart grid standard or a scatter standard, the engineer had to do the security, took the block cipher standards. And the first one is ECB mode. And he and they implement this, right? It's an absolute disaster, okay? Never ever use this mode. But it looks good on my picture, I must say. So, block ciphers got a big boost because the US government decided in 1976, around that time, to actually publish a standard, well, it was published in 77 afterwards, called the Data Encryption Standard. And this is kind of the stamp of approval of the US government. It was mandatory for sensitive but unclassified information. The cryptographers hated the DES because we were not told how it was working. We were not told how it was exactly designed. And even today, the account of the design given by IBM and NSA is still different. So NSA changed the design. For example, NSA said, we decided on the key length. And the key length is 56 bits. And with everything I told you, you now understand 56 bits. Even in the 70s, the NSA could break 56-bit keys. Okay? This is how it was designed, that only NSA could break it, but nobody else. And cryptographers knew this, but somehow NSA could push it through. But also the internals of this were not revealed. We found some attacks in the 80s, and then we understood better how this was made. But even today, there is no document this explaining us every step of DES. Okay. So, this is how it works. I don't have time for this, but it's also designed to minimize hardware. So encryption and decryption have the same form. So you can save in your chip area. And so the big internal debate is why are these wires this way? And what is in these substitution boxes that go from six to four bits? So we still don't fully understand how they're designed, but we're now getting closer and closer. Okay, what is the real problem is the key length. So you can do a simple back of the envelope calculation and you'll find that with 100 PCs you can find the key in a month today. 22 years ago, Mike Rina made a design and he said, look guys, one million dollars, I find the key in three hours, stop using this. It's not serious anymore. Okay? At that moment, NIST was considering to reaffirm the standard for another five years and this paper said, look, maybe DES was acceptable in 77, but in 93, it's a joke. What was the response of the banks? The banks put their head in the sand and say, we don't want to change it. Please reaffirm DES again. This is just a paper design. So then, for other reasons to do with export control, EFF sponsored a desk key break machine in 98. They really built it. They made a book with all the design details. It's actually quite a bad design. With students in Leuven, we made it about 50 times faster in the next years. But this was just quick and dirty, done in a few months. And then the reaction in the banks was panic. Oh, this can really be done. This is a problem. So it's the difference between an engineer and a banker. An engineer looks at the paper and says, hmm, there is a problem. And the banker will only see the problem if he sees the device that does it. Then there is a real problem. Okay? The banks have then decided to abandon this. Their time schedule was five years, 2003. I gave a talk in 2006 in Australia. There were still people using DES in Australia at that time. And I'm quite sure I want to bet with you that there were still banks in the world using single DES in some places. So it's very difficult to kill. Even if cryptographers are shouting about it for 20 years, we're just being ignored until there is a real attack. US government finally gave in in 2004. Of course, the answer we know, the answer to DES, you can also call this the revenge of IBM, because clearly IBM was not happy with the key length. 
So immediately after the publication of this, IBM published a paper saying, by the way, you can do triple this. Okay? Why not double this? Because double this is not much better than single this. It gives you 70 bits of key. But triple this is three times this in the middle of decryption. For backward compatibility, if you take key one and key two equal, then you have single this. So it's a weakness of triple this, but a feature for the banks. So if you make key one equal to key three, then you have two key triple this. That's been approved by the US government for <coughs> until 2009, and three key triple deaths has been approved by the US government until 2030. So if the banks upgraded in 98 to triple deaths, which variant did they choose? Two key triple deaths. So in fact, the banks are now using a system without approval of the US government, but I guess they now feel that they can ignore it. And I must say for once, the banks are right. Because US government esteems that two key triple deaths gives you only 80 bit security. But this assumes you encrypt two to the 40 text with one key. And as far as I know, at least in Europe, I don't think the banks encrypt more than two to the 10 text with one key. And in that case, two key triple deaths is actually better than three key triple deaths. <laughs> so for once, the banks are right, but the US government doesn't want to approve this. Now, this is, of course, all legacy. What we want to use is something more modern, the advanced encryption standard. So the US government published an open call in 97. Um, major players enter the competition. The key lengths are way bigger, between 128 and 256. Also the block lengths had to be as strong as triple DES and more efficient and royalty free. And so the winners were a Belgian algorithm, the Rheindel algorithm designed by Vincent Raymond and Johan Damen which is a very elegant design that is efficient both on smart cards and in hardware and on high-end machines. So the standard was published in 2001. There is now 3,200 certified implementations and probably 10 times more uncertified implementations. After a few years, the US government allowed to use AES for secret and top secret information, which is the first time that this was done because before that, every algorithm to encrypt secret information was top secret itself. The only ones who have not adopted AES are the banks. They still use triple DES in their cards. Except for contactless because their triple DES is really too slow, that they switch to AES. So, Shortly after publication of the standard, Coutroy wrote a paper saying he could break AES by solving the equations, but even today, nobody can even do it on a very small version of AES, and the attacks doesn't, doesn't seem to work. The big problem of AES is timing attacks. Many implementations are not constant time. So one of my students, um, together with Peter Schwab, Emilia Kasper and Peter Schwab, published a very nice content time implementation, which actually was also twice faster than the previous implementation. The only requirement is you have to encrypt eight blocks at the same time. So it doesn't work for every setting. And then, of course, we got support by Intel. Um, about five years ago, Intel started adding an AES instruction to its processors, which makes AES constant time and blazingly fast. So when AES was selected, it required 15 cycles to encrypt a byte. Um, with the best software today, it takes seven cycles to encrypt a byte. With Intel hardware, the fastest ones, it takes 10 times less up to 0.63 cycles to encrypt one byte. This is faster than you can read and write to memory. So you can no longer say that encryption is too slow on those devices. What are limitations of encryption? Well, apparently some people have legacy systems in which they would like to have a credit card encrypt to a credit card number. It's still a mystery to me how you can design systems which are based on the secrecy of a 10-digit number, which you spread everywhere. But still, it seems that this still exists in the minds of some people and apparently a large-scale business. But so there is clever tricks. There is encryption techniques that allow you to encrypt a credit card number into another credit card number. But then you need very special techniques. AES or stream cipher will not do this. <coughs> encryption does not hide the length of the plain text. And this can be a problem. For example, if you visit the website with medical information from the URL, you may see which diseases somebody has consulted. So the solution is to pad your plain text, but this is not done very often. 
Okay? It does not hide the existence of plain text. So somebody may arrest you and say you communicated with this person. Okay? And of course, it doesn't hide to whom you're talking. So for this, you will have to use something like Tor, and you'll hear more about that from George later this week. So, of course, encryption techniques are used in all those protections, but basic encryption doesn't protect those things. So, next step is data authentication. So, we use two techniques, one without a key and one with a key. So, confidentiality is about hiding the content. Data authentication is about who sent the information. Has the information been modified? And sometimes also timeliness and sequence of messages. So for example, in a banking system, in every bank card there is a counter which can only go up, and if it reaches FFFF, then it stops. The card stops and it's over. So this way you can never just send a payment again and get the money twice. So this is also an aspect of authentication which is not dealt with by crypto, but at the next layer of abstraction. Okay. So it's typically more complex than encryption. So the standard solution, the default solution is shift authenticity of data to secrecy of keys. So rather than encrypt your data, you will condense your data under control of a secret key into a short string. What is short? Four bytes for retail banking. On the internet, it's 12 bytes. And some schemes even use 16 bytes. But a very short string. And so you just send this string along with the plain text. So there is no secrecy here. You just compute the Mac and you append these four or 16 bytes to your plain text. What does Bob do? He gets the plain text. He knows the key. He recomputes the Mac and checks it the same as the one received together with the plain text. And if it's not the same, then he rejects. So what is the problem for Eve? Eve wants to modify the message, which is easy but she doesn't know the key. So if you don't know the key and you modify one letter here, you actually don't know how this string will change and so you can't predict it. So if you don't know the key, you can't predict the Mac value and so the best thing you can do is guess it, but this will not give you a very good success probability. So a Mac shifts authenticity of data to secrecy of keys. And so Macs are widely used in all banking transactions, all credit card transactions. If you use SSH or TLS or IPsec, every packet is in principle mac So a typical Mac length, as I said, four to 12 bytes. And what is the, the threat? Well, if you take too few bits, it's too easy to guess. So I think four bytes is really the, the, the lower edge um, because then you only need four billion guesses. Key lengths. Well, the same problem as for encryption, the opponent sees a few text and max, there is no secrets there, and you can try to find out which keys match. So you want a large key space, again, I would say at least 100 bits or more. And there is also some technical attacks that show that security is actually much less than you expect. There is kind of a square root effect, but I don't have time to explain that. So the banks, they use CBC Mac, I'll show you in the next slide. It's based on a block cipher, so the banks use CBC Mac based on triple DES. On the internet, you find quite some HMAC. HMAC is a hash function with a key. I'll, I'll show that to you. Um, or CBC MAC based on AES. This is what you find on the internet. And you now find a trend to the equivalent of the one-time path, which is information totally secure MACs. And why do people use those? Because they are very fast. But the problem is you have to use your key only once. Okay, now what is the warning? Be very careful because for efficiency reasons, many of those schemes reuse part of the key, and suddenly the security proofs don't look as nice. Okay? So for example, GMAC, um, I have serious reservations because it actually reuses part of the key. I don't think it's a good idea. Many people disagree with me. For example, Intel has added an instruction to support GMAC. And so Intel is a big fan of GMAC. So I promised I would show you CBC Mac. So CBC Mac is, uh, CBC mode is the default way of using a block cipher, which we now advise against, but for Macing it's fine. But for encryption, I guess if you paid attention in your crypto class or you didn't choose ECB, you probably chose CBC, although the advice is now don't use it, but okay. So what is CBC? You encrypt the first block, you get a ciphertext. 
You add this to the next plaintext block, you encrypt, you get a ciphertext. You add it to the next plaintext block, and you get a ciphertext. That's CBC mode. Now, what is CBC Mac? It's the same thing, but you throw out all these ciphertext blocks, intermediate ones. The last one you encrypt again, or sometimes you do something weird to P3 that can be equivalent, and then you keep 64 bits of the result. That's CBC Mac. So it's very simple. You compute a complex function of every bit of the plain text and the key. Hardware people don't like it because it's a serial algorithm. So you can only start computing this AES if you're done with this one. So if you really want to go very fast, it's not so nice. But for bank cards, it's definitely fine. There is also, I would say, the most difficult part of crypto is crypto without keys. This is like, you know, magician without sleeves. This is really, really hard. You have no keys to hide anything. And this is known as hash functions, or the old IBM term from the 80s is manipulation detection codes. So you just compress an input with no keys. So would it be sufficient to just take a plain text and put a hash value and send this over? Would that be a good solution? I've seen people who do this. Why not? Of course, you can just take any other plain text and hash it yourself. The hash function is public and send it again. But still people think it gives protection. It's, it's magically. I mean, it's kind of crypto magic that doesn't work, right? So how was this used by the Belgian banks? Go back to the 80s. Many of you were probably not even born, but OK. So in the 80s, people communicated not with computer networks, but with magnetic tapes, about 30 centimeter diameter. And so at the end of the month, the CFO of a company would produce the tapes with the salaries and would send this by courier to the bank who would load the tape on their machine and pay the salaries to the people. What is the attack? The courier stops at a friend who is working for a computer company. He loads the tape, finds his salary and multiplies it by 10 and then drives on to the bank. To stop this, the CFO computes the hash value, calls up the banker and reads his value on the phone. Okay. So what you do is you shift authenticity of a large file, that of a short string. Okay? So the same thing if I borrow my laptop to somebody, then, especially my own students, I will hash all my files, and I will write a value on a piece of paper which I have in my pocket here. And when I get the laptop back, I can rehash, and I can check whether the value is the same. So what I did is I protected the authenticity of 100 gigabytes by 20 bytes, which I can write down and just put in my pocket. So you, again, you shift problems, authenticity of files, of large files to short files. So some people would ask me, and what if the hash value is different? Well, I can't get my files back, obviously, but I know that something bad happens. Okay? So designing hash functions is tricky. We need several properties. Um, it should be hard to invert. So given an output, find an input. If you look at the example of the banker or my files, the, the guy with the car and the magnetic tape has the files and the hash. What he wants to do is find a different file with a larger salary for him and the same hash. Then his attack will go through. We call this a second pre-image. And if my hash value is n bits, it's take two to the n steps. But in some settings, in particular for signatures and code updates by malicious parties. In fact, you can produce collisions. This is good enough, which is two distinct inputs with the same output. It seems to be the same as this, but it's not. Because here you have full degrees of freedom. And by some clever statistics, finding collisions is way harder and takes only the square root to the n over 2 for an n-bit hash value. And so it turns out that making Hash function, which is hard to find collisions, is a hard thing. I think the half lifetime of a hash function is eight to nine months. So I would say a stream cipher is something like a year, a block cipher is two or three years, or a hash function is eight months. So I tell my students, if you want to design a hash function, do it in the last six months of your PhD. So that you first get your degree and then it can get broken, right? That's so MD5 was the most widely used hash function. It was a very clever design by Rivest, the R of RSA, the same person, very smart person who designed RC4. But in hash functions, he took a bit too many risks. He also made MD2, which is not very secure, MD4, which was broken quite quickly. 
Um, and then he made MD5 and cryptographically looked at this and we said, no. I mean, it's cool, it's fast, it's free, but it's not secure enough. We wrote reports in 93 saying don't use it. What happened with our advice? It was ignored. Even the RSA company published a bulletin in 96 saying stop using MD5. What happened? It was ignored. And then Professor Wang came, a very bright Chinese professor, in 2004, and she showed how to find collisions for MD5 in 15 minutes. Okay. Microsoft, at that moment, hired the MD5 removal person. This person found 800 ways in which MD5 was used in Microsoft software. The task of this person was to remove MD5. This person has failed because the flame attack, you may have heard about this two years ago, malware and APT used collisions on MD5 to forge certificates. Um, so MD5 was still in Microsoft software in 2012. So it's very hard to get rid of anything. US government had SHA-1. You should know that SHA-1 is actually a new standard in the sense that first US government put out SHA-0 or SHA. And after one year, they replaced it by something else because they broke it themselves. This was 93. In 94, they put out SHA-1. Professor Wang showed that breaking SHA-1 is at least 2,000 times easier than expected. And so today, SHA-1 should not be trusted. So this person in Microsoft is now the SHA-1 removal person, I think. So there is SHA-2, also designed by the NSA. But I'm not sure we should trust them because they also designed SHA-0 and SHA-1. And then there is SHA-3. The US government didn't know what to do, so they did an open competition. In fact, they could have saved the effort because the winners were the Belgians again. So the winning algorithm was a Ketchak team. Well, it's actually Johan Dahmen together with um, some other people and one Italian guy. So it's a very innovative and elegant design, which gives you much higher security. For some reasons which are hard to understand, it has taken more than two years to publish the standard, but the draft is already out now for several months, so I hope that they finally will put the stamp of approval on it. So we had a hash function crisis, and so my advice is check for your hash functions and see whether you can get rid of them. So back to how to use AES. So in the DES standard, the modes operation standard, there were four modes, ECB you should never use, CBC, which you should get rid of, OF, CFB, which is really not necessary for modern communications anymore, and OFB, which is also legacy. I guess the best way to use AES is counter mode, where you encrypt a counter. There is also a MAC algorithm, CMAC. I'm not the biggest fan of it, but at least it's a reasonable design. But in fact, as I told you at the beginning, you don't need encryption, and there is no application where you just need encryption. What you need is authenticated encryption. You need the equivalent of an envelope where you can't see what's in and you can't modify it. That's what you really need. So there is solutions from the late 90s, IAPM, XCCB, and the most efficient one, OCB. But all these are governed by patents, and there is big arguments between the patent holders. So nobody wants to touch those schemes. The patents will expire in about five years. So then you can start using them. Then NIST has standardized two schemes, CCM and GCM. There is some debate whether this was the best choice. So CCM and GCM are slower than OCB, but they're patent free. So CCM I trust more, but it's not parallelizable because it has the CBC Mac stuff in there. GCM I don't like because it reuses part of the key where it shouldn't for performance reasons. But GCM is the one being pushed by many major, major players today. Okay, so what to use? So my advice is use AES-128-256 in CCM mode and change the key regularly. Okay, don't use it with too long keys. For stream ciphers, um, in hardware, it's no 3G. Well, you have to find variants because you have to pay HCL license. Trivium only gives you 80-bit security, so don't use it for anything serious. And by the way, it's my own design disclaimer, so you know what I said about cryptographers. Um, and then... The, Google seems to go for ChaCha20, uh, which is a relatively new design by Dan Bernstein. It has very good performance and is on processes without hardware support. But we all acknowledge that there is a problem. And so the, Dan Bernstein, together with a large team of people, has decided to start a more or less unfunded open competition. This gives a little bit of money. It's called the Caesar competition. 
And there we tried to make for you better schemes for authenticated encryption. We got 55 submissions or something like this. I think about one third has been broken by now. And so we'll, in the next month or two, we will announce the second round candidates. And so in about two or three years from now, you'll get hopefully better solutions than anything before. That doesn't help you today, but at least keep an eye on this and you'll see what's moving. Okay, so cryptography moves secret to keys. The question is, how do I get those keys into place? This is a real nightmare, especially in open networks. Imagine you want to... Yes. Yes, it is. Ketchak has a most authenticated encryption, and this mode has been submitted to Caesar. But you should be aware that I mean, so I think they're very clever people. They've made nice designs, but already changed them a few times. And so my advice would be, I mean, NIST will definitely not put out a standard with immediate authenticated encryption. They will just put a hash function standard. Okay, my advice is before using authenticated encryption modes, wait at least until the dust has settled in the CISO competition. I think it's a bit early. The, Yes, definitely. And they have several designs, lightweight designs, because the main catch has a 1600-bit state. So for some embedded devices, this is kind of inconvenient. But there is also smaller versions called Catcher and so on, so they've worked on this. It definitely, it's one of the leading contenders there, but I would not say or take this and use it because we still, even understanding all the properties, we're not done yet. So there is still papers published with new properties of authenticated encryption. So it's a bit early. I would say then stick with the ones which have been standardized and well understood rather than go for a new scheme. That's a very good comment. It's definitely a leading contender. So how to deal with those keys or how to establish them? Well, we all know that it's a problem. And I think I've been warning people about the problem. Think of the GSM keys. There were 6 billion GSM users and they all have a secret key in their SIM card. You've all read the news, so you know what happened to these SIM cards. Right? So the keys were there, but somehow they have to be produced and sent to the operator. And well, those things have been hacked. By the way, um, yeah, this has been recorded. After the recording is done, I will tell you a bit more about this. But some things I cannot say on the recording about this stuff. But so it's a big problem because you have all your keys in one place. Okay? So the good news is we don't need this because Diffie and Hellman came up with a scheme called public key encryption. You can encrypt with the public key of Amazon or eBay and send them a key, say, or a credit card number, and only they can decrypt with the private key. This is much more convenient. If this would not exist, if you were going to eBay, there would be a pop-up saying, wait, we'll send you a key, uh, watch your mail for the next week, and then after a week, you would get an envelope with the key, and then you could communicate securely. It wouldn't be very efficient for Amazon or eBay, right? But so with public key, you can actually use it right away. It's like an, a mailbox. You put a mailbox in front of your house, which is deep enough. Anybody can drop the letter in there, but only you have the key to get it out. That's what public key does. Did we now solve the problem? No. Cryptographers never solve problems. We move the problem to the authenticity of public keys. How do I know that this is the public key of Amazon? Okay. How do I know? It's the same thing with the mailbox. If there is a mailbox there which has his name Bob, how do I know it's Bob's mailbox and not Eve's mailbox? Because it says, yeah, but nobody can put a sticker on something, right? It's, that's the problem. So later this week, I will devote a whole lecture on this problem, how to be sure that this is Alice's public key and how we messed this up. You may have seen the recent news on malware that actually changes all these things. So this is a, a major problem which we messed up in the implementation. So you can also kind of reverse the roles and sign with the private key using a signature algorithm. And then you have something very similar to a Mac with one difference. You can verify with the public key of Alice. So this is much nicer because a Mac can only be verified by Alice and Bob and Alice and Bob can both compute and verify. While here you have asymmetry, only Alice can sign, but anybody can verify. Also a judge who wants to Settle a dispute between Alice and Bob can do this and say, okay, this was signed by Alice's private key or not. Okay, this is very nice. And so this is widely used for all code updates, for example, in six billion devices, we actually have this kind of technique to sign code updates. The question of course is again, 
what about the public key? Because you move authenticity of the APA now to the authenticity of the public key. If my phone says Herbert is correct, it means somehow my phone has checked this with the public key somewhere written on my device. Okay. So a widely used system is Diffie-Hellman. In the interest of time, I will not say too much about this. It uses some very simple crypto magic to actually have an open conversation and then as a consequence, you have a secret key. It's really magic and depends on some number theory. Diffie-Hellman was a scheme proposed by Diffie and Hellman, obviously. They could, this, you can't encrypt stuff with this. You can only send, agree on a secret key. And Diffie-Hellman was not so popular because it's more expensive than RSA. If more exponentiations. But after a lot of NSA hacking was revealed, many major vendors actually switched to Diffie-Hellman because it gives you better properties. Essentially, if somebody asks for your keys, uh, your long-term keys, they cannot find the user keys of the past. And I'll explain that in more detail um, tomorrow or the day after. So in Diffie and Hellman were in Stanford. In MIT, Rives, Chimir, and Edelman proposed the RSA algorithm. I assume you've all heard about this. So again, lots of mathematics, but RSA is based on factoring. So you take two large prime numbers and they're easy to generate. Today, I would say at least 1,000 bits. You can multiply them and then do all this crypto magic. And security relies on the fact that given P and Q, you can do all this stuff. But if I give you only N, the product of them, you can't actually factor and find P and Q. That's the intuition uh, behind RSA. Okay. So can we prove factoring is hard? No. What we can do is we can look at historic progress. Before RSA was invented, people could do up to 40 digits. And we've seen steady improvements. This is academic records. Okay. And for about 20 years, there has been no algorithmic improvements anymore. So in the first 20 years, 15, 20 years, there were many ideas, but now there is a stagnation. We still see improvements as a consequence of better computers and more computers. This is the factoring record done in academic world six years ago on PlayStation cell processors. Okay. There is no doubt that the NSA can factor today routinely 1024 bit numbers and probably some other agencies as well. So look at this for key lengths. There is documents giving you advice, but at least use 1500 bits and 2000 bits is probably better. There is also a long-term threat, which is quantum computers. And if those things can be built, factoring and also discrete log breaking Diffie-Hellman will become trivial. Can it be done? Well, here you see one of the first seven bit quantum computers developed in Stanford. It took one year to build a computer and one year to write a program. And the result of all this work was a factorization of 15. So since then, there hasn't been much progress in factoring numbers. The record has been improved three years ago to 143. But you can read this later. In fact, the experts in quantum computing claim that in 10 to 15 years, they will be done. And they have a big one. And they'll be breaking RSA at large scale for low cost. You never know with guys in physics, right? They promise you fusion. In the 60s, they promise us fusion. They promise us cold fusion. And they always say, give us more money. And then we'll do it. And sometimes they deliver. Sometimes they don't. So it's very risky. And so I'm kind of joking a bit about these numbers. But it has nothing to do with the real progress. The real progress is how long can they keep qubits in superposition and insulation. And there they're making substantial progress every year. So it's not completely out of the blue. This may really happen. And then we have a big problem. And for this purpose, we're looking at new algorithms that would not be vulnerable to quantum computers. This is a big research project we're involved in. So public key shifts problem to authenticity of public keys. Okay. It allows you to agree keys in an open environment. It allows you to digitally sign documents so that the sender can be identified, separated from the receiver, and any third party can resolve disputes. So it allows really very cool stuff. You can also do auctions, voting, whatever, many cool things with public key. Without public key, our world will be very boring, and many exciting schemes can be done. On the other hand, it's actually 10 to 100 times slower than symmetric key. So you will always use hybrid crypto in which you use the public key 
to agree keys, and then the symmetric key for the bulk data. So you have much larger keys, 10 to 20 times larger. I have to warn you as well, if you use post-quantum secure algorithms, the keys can be megabytes. So you may well be using public key schemes in 10 or 15 years with megabytes of keys, and you have to start thinking about it. How will that change what I'm doing? It's, I'm not speaking science fiction. It may happen in 10 years. You'll have to switch to this. Megabytes public keys. Okay. And of course, we can't prove that these schemes are secure. Is factoring hard or not? Maybe tomorrow somebody wakes up and finds out how to factor, and then we have a big problem. So final thing. I'm not really the expert in crypto libraries, but this is something I think there is many. I'm not sure there is actually many in constant time, and I should have added actually a library called SALT, which you actually write like this. It's a library by Dan Bernstein and his colleagues. And in fact, it's one of the few which actually is constant time. And so I'm, I think many of those are actually not constant time. There is many. Um, and you've also heard about OpenSSL and Heartbleed. So it's a widely used crypto library, but there is also problems with it. And then as a final slide, um, it's really, again, quite radical. But on the left, I put some things you should use. And on the right, some things you probably should not be using or you should be shying away from. OK? It's time to wrap up here. Thank you very much for your attention. Of course, I'm happy to still take questions.